Welcome to Law Officer Live. It's December 14th, 2016. Thank you for being with us tonight. We are the only law enforcement show strictly for law enforcement by law enforcement. And that's why it is so important that you share this with your timeline, spread the word on this show. We talk about issues that nobody else chooses to talk about. They're easy to talk about, but people don't choose to talk about it. And they're not even controversial. It's just the truth in what law enforcement's dealing with and the future of law enforcement and what law enforcement is dealing with today. And tonight is a special episode. I don't do questions and answers very often. First off, I don't find myself that interesting, but we get a lot of questions that come in through our website, through our Facebook pages, and we took, we're taking the time tonight to answer some of those questions. Most of those are current issues, current things going on, so we look forward to giving you the best answer we possibly can there, and it is also your chance to go on to Facebook in the comment section and to send us any questions you like. We'll do our best to get to it, and if not, we'll hold it for the next question answer episode. So with that said, we'll go ahead and start the show. You can either live your dreams or live your fears. And I think the majority of people actually are not living their dreams, but are living their fears. So I want to ask you a question. What are your fears? What are you afraid of? What are you scared of? Because we all have fears, don't we? We all have something that's blocking us, that's holding us back. And as we begin to look at life, what we realize is that the reason that most people are not living out their true potential and not doing all of the things that they would really like to do is because of fear. I want to be the person everyone looks up to, and I want to be the person that inspires you. Everyone is special, and everyone has their own demons. The goal is to take control and destroy the past. Some say that the grass is greener on the other side, but I am just going to make my own grass. Everything in life happens for a reason. We may not know right now, and we may never find out. But if you are one of the lucky ones, you will figure out a reason for some of the things that have happened to you in your past. Life is exciting, and you have to look forward to the next moment, good or bad. Never give up. Never quit. That was Officer Travis Owens, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. That video was produced from their wellness unit, one of the upper echelon top wellness programs in the country. I would encourage any of you out there that are looking at doing the same, and you need to do the same, to contact them to let them help you. That video was produced by a good friend of mine, Ron Shellnut, also an author here at LawOfficer.com. And I thought it was important during this time of the year to discuss some of these issues. That officer, I don't have time to go into detail, 
Uh, we were actually working on uh, uh, some information on that officer to kind of share to all of you, hopefully, very, very soon. But he was lost, and he was on his way to a very dark place. He was in a very dark place, and through uh, the great program they had there at IMPD, they saved him. And you see that in the video there. Obviously, he had a major injury uh, to his leg that was holding him back. He decided to go ahead and go through an amputation. You see that video there that is symbolic because that is the same field that he was about to kill himself in just months before. And so we have many officers hurting, especially this time of year. Uh, this time of year is not only special for me to talk about this, but it also is hurtful for myself. I don't usually get very personal on these issues, but uh, it's, it's time for us to quit being silent. We have a lot of people hurting. Uh, last Christmas was the worst Christmas of my life. My mother was in her last days of her life, and I'll never forget it. And, I, and this Christmas is obviously very, very painful as it's coming up on that culmination one year anniversary of her death, a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I will tell you uh, that while I consider myself healthy and well, uh, to the, even the best of us uh, can have severe difficulty, especially this time of year. I'm not diminishing the rest of the year, but it's almost as if sometimes these holidays can trigger a lot of raw emotions. And I want you to know there is help. We have good friends at the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The number is there on your screen. And you can call them. Everything is confidential. Let me encourage you to do that. You may not have a department that you can go to, or you may not have people there that you can trust. Uh, we know for a fact that this hotline uh, will help you. There's obviously no cost involved. Everything's confidential. And to some of you, that's important because there are states like Illinois where if they find out you've gone to a psychologist for an issue like this, they can actually take your gun away, meaning you can never be a police officer again. Uh, do we wonder why Illinois is so screwed up, right, when they treat their law enforcement that way? Very much a shame. Uh, so with that said, there's plenty of resources we're actually building out a lot of those resources on our website, lawofficer.com, as I speak. Another website I want to tell you about is called Badge of Life. You can find that website at badgeoflife.com. Wonderful friends of ours doing great, great work. Let me just encourage you as we come up on the Christmas season uh, to do all it takes for you and those around you to make sure that you are living well and healthy. Life is short, and we must do everything we can to be as healthy as possible. Uh, you can always contact us through our website. There's a phone number there also on our website. We'll be glad to take your call. We'll be glad to send you to other resources or to help you any way we can. Uh, you are the most important thing to us, not business or advertising, a whole host of things that we have to do to pay the bills, so to speak. But it's you, uh, the police officers and the family of the police officers and the retired police officers and the citizens that support us so much. You are why we do what we do. And we want to do all we can to help you. So check out those resources and let us know if you need anything. You just watched the body cam images of just a few nights ago in Lavania, Georgia, where two of those police officers were shot by that suspect. Uh, fortunately, they're both going to be okay. Uh, but how tragically it could have turned very, very quickly. And that video prompted an article that you'll find right on the front of page of our website, which is our article of the week, which talks about six Georgia police officers have been shot in the last six days. And it talks about the rising trend in officer uh, shootings and officer deaths. Uh, we have been uh, involved in line of duty deaths feloniously at a, at a pace 72% higher than last year. 
our annual line of duty deaths are 15% higher than last year. And all the while we have entities and major newspapers talking about how safe our job is. And I would ask you that if 132 reporters were shot in, in the commission of doing their job this, this so far in 2016, would reporters have that same attitude that keep continuing to say that our jobs are so safe? So obviously it's personal to us, it's personal to you. You watch that video and the first thing that comes to mind is the same thing that come to your mind. Why are we not controlling the hands? The hands, uh, as our friend Buck Savage would always say, the, friend, the hands are what can hurt you and what can kill you. And we see this officer, you know, well-trained, active officer, lackadaisical letting this guy keep his hands in his pocket. Boy, the question sure does come to mind, doesn't it, is are we not practicing these basic safety techniques because we're worried, because we're scared, because we're afraid to get accused of being racist. I mean, it makes you wonder. And the only reason I wonder is because every police officer in America knows you do not let anyone keep their hands in their pocket, period. And this is just a traffic stop. There's nothing at this point, I believe, that would made them suspect there was anything more than a traffic stop. But we never let people keep their hands in their pockets, and you saw the reason why. We, of course, saw the backing officer attempt to rectify that, and things got very ugly after that. Uh, but we've seen other instances this year. We saw an instance in the Northeast where there was a man so out of his mind in a restaurant at lunchtime that the entire restaurant emptied out and they called the police. And the responding officer uh, sat down next to him and, you know, put his arm around him and tried to console him and the guy took a gun out and blew his head off. And then went out in the parking lot and killed another police officer. Yeah, it makes you wonder that are we being influenced by all of this nonsense and fog out there in social media and all the reports, and we're going to talk about that in our question and answer session, about are we really using a lot of deadly force? Are we really shooting a lot of unarmed people? The question is no. Absolutely no. We cannot be a victim of this media bias. And we all see what they're about. Just see how they've treated some folks in politics lately and see how they've treated some of us. And so I think it's really behoove on our leaders to make sure your officers know Despite what they hear in the news media, despite what they read in the newspaper or on social media or on Facebook, you've got to practice safety basic techniques, officer safety techniques. You know, if they would have made this gentleman, he's not a gentleman, he's a coward, I apologize. If they would have made this coward, hey, get your hands out of your pocket, and he didn't, and they would have had to take him and put him over the car and, and take his hands and pat him down real quick. And he wants to, you know, let's say he had nothing on him and he wants to complain and call him racist. The leaders in that department need to assure those officers, I don't care. If you're practicing basic safety measures as a law enforcement officer, who cares what people accuse you of? Okay, now it is on us to, you know, explain to people why we do what we do. But you have to be a complete idiot if you walk up to a policeman with your hands in your pocket and acting all nervous and don't expect a policeman to kind of come almost come unhinged. Have you seen what's going on in America today with law enforcement officers being brutally attacked and assaulted and murdered? So the days of, of us of calling to this have got to be over with. And leaders, I encourage you, don't take it for granted your officers think you have your back. You know, by the way, maybe you don't have their back. And if you don't, you're a coward. But we hope, if you've been paying attention to us, you have your officers back. And don't take it for granted they know that. Send them an email. Do what we did in my agency, you know, have the chief actually address them in training and say, listen, here's what the law says, here's what you can do, as long as you do this, I have your back. Assure them of that, and we must do that. We must do that, because our officers have got to know when they're out there in situations like you just saw in that video, that they can do what needs to be done to go home at night. Now, fortunately, those officers didn't go home that night. They went to the hospital, but they will be going home eventually. So our prayers are with them and their families, but oh, how worse that could have been. And we've seen in Georgia in the last week, two officers murdered on a domestic violence call. Uh, one of them, I, a friend of mine, was his stepbrother. Very tragic stuff. Now, we don't know the details of all this, but I know when I watch that video, some things come out pretty starkly. So we wrote the article just today talking about the increase in violence, increase in line of duty deaths in law enforcement, and we give you four things to think about. I'm going to cover three right now, but let me encourage you to go to lawofficer.com, right in the middle of the page under editorial, and click on that article, read it centered around. Number one, the days of minimum training must be over. If I hear one more time a police department go, yeah, what's the minimum training, what's the minimum hours? Hey, listen, in most states, it's about 20 to 25 hours a year. 
Okay, some, I've heard uh, one state two years was 48 hours. So we're talking 20, 25 hours. Let me tell you something. Your hairdresser gets more training than that. Your bank teller gets more training than that. Everybody in America, for the most part, is getting more training than that. So that is ridiculous. I don't care what the state minimum is. You need to be better than that. And officers that are listening to this, deputies, if your department's not giving it to you, go out and get it. Whose responsibility is it to get great training? It's our responsibility. You owe it to your family, and you owe it to your fellow brothers and sisters behind the badge. So uh, you leaders out there, you have one job, predominantly one job. Give your officers the safest environment possible. And if you're not doing that, and if you're providing minimum training, you don't need to be in this line of work. It's just that simple. You know, I get accused a lot. Somebody told me today, they said, yeah, it's you speak your mind so much, people get upset at you. I'm sorry if you don't like the truth. But if you are not providing your officers the training needed to keep them safe, okay, and I would start with simunition training, force-on-force -force training, and I would end with it. Because every research and study out there says that prepares us best for violent encounters is force-on-force -force training. Uh, simunition is the name of a brand, but there's other brands out there. Uh, if simunition is listening, feel free to contact us. We'd love to have you help us out with this. But it should start with that, and it should end with that. And you can do some things in between and talk about mental health and all the kind of legalities and legal updates and things we are mandated to do. But if you're not providing your officers with training that can keep them safe, keep them alive, you don't need to be in this line of work. You definitely don't need to be a chief or a sheriff. Just get out. Please help us all and leave. And it's just that simple. You may not like it, but maybe you should look in the mirror if you don't like it. Get better. Get better. Whether you have money or not, get better. And if somebody's out there and you're a chief or a sheriff and you go, you know what? I want to provide this training, but I have no resources and no training. I no resources or no money. I challenge you to contact us. You contact us. You tell us your problem. We will get you training there. We will. It's just that simple. That's what we, that's what we care about here. And the excuses are over have you not been paying attention with what's going on in law enforcement today point number two we point out in the article po politicians and activists have no business dictating officers procedures when it comes to tactics let me repeat that for you politicians and activists have no business dictating what we do when it comes to police tactics they are not police experts they have no background they have no training they do not know what the standards are they should not be involved in our tactics training. Now, if they want to give you opinions on certain policies and things like that, I don't care. But when it comes to tactics and officer safety, they need to stay out of our business and we need to stop listening to them. We've got to man up and stop listening to them. And uh, it just drives me absolutely crazy when I see videos like you just saw. It, and it can't, I can't help but think that all this chatter from politicians and activists have impacted our officers. And that's got to stop. End of story. Uh, number three, we still see our police officers working without basic safety equipment. Okay, now I'm not talking about high-end SWAT gear, okay, that very few departments are able to kind of do. I'm talking basic equipment like a ballistic vest. Okay, I'm not going to tell you the percentage of officers in this country that don't have them. You could probably do that research yourself, but I don't want to tip off people that may be nefariously watching this, right? But there are officers in this country that don't have ballistic vests. Can you believe that any chief, any sheriff, any mayor, or any city administrator would fill the police department and not give them a ballistic vest? Let me tell you something. That should be a crime. And uh, unfortunately, I've seen that time and time and time again. That's over with. If you're out there and you are not providing your officers with a ballistic vest, then you don't need to be a police department. It's that simple if you don't have resources to do that. Now, if you're out there as an officer and you're not, you don't have a vest, ask surrounding agencies around you. See if they have extras. You know, many, many larger agencies uh, will have extra vests. And uh, you can also contact our friends at vestforlife.com, B-E-S-T-F-R life.com, who recycles vests and gives them out to officers around the country. They've given out just shy of 10,000 of those in the last several years. And you know what? If all that fails, once again, contact us here at lawofficer.com because we will do everything we can do to get you that basic safety equipment. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our sponsor, and if you've been paying attention to our show, our sponsor has been, for some time now, Blue Armor Supplements. It's the first supplement company designed for law enforcement, by law enforcement, and if you're wondering if it's quality or not, take a look at the supplements you currently take and see if they're GMP approved, good manufacturing practices. 
If the supplements you take are not GMP approved, then you have no idea what you're taking. All GMP means is, is what the bottle says is in the bottle. And you know what I found when I looked in my cupboard? Cupboard. Do we still have cupboards? I guess we do. When I looked in my cabinets, uh, this is what I found with my supplements. None of them were GMP approved. I have friends that's popped positive on a drug test for steroids, and they were taking a vitamin, right? Because they went to the local store where the teenager was working and bought some vitamins, and unbeknownst to them, it had got mixed maxed in the factory and got some illegal substances in it, and he popped positive on it. And what do you think the department said when he tried to tell them that story? They said, oh, what are you talking about? You're lying to us, right? So do yourself a favor. Check out bluearmor.com. And I can tell you from a personal standpoint, I would not let them have a part of this show if it was not for real. Now, I don't like talking about myself, but I'll tell you this. Go back to our early episodes here on Law Officer Live. You can go to lawofficer.com, go up to the media section, the Law Officer Live section, the very top banner. Click on some of the older episodes. I've worn this shirt before. Okay, I'm going to show you how loose this is. You will see a difference, okay? And uh, I'm not saying it to brag. I'm just saying that's the power of Blue Armor, of taking those products, because I've never taken a vitamin before where I actually felt the difference, right? And you feel the difference on these products because it's actually the products. It sounds crazy, but the supplement industry is very corrupt. And so let me encourage you to do that. They've got some incredible deals out there right now. The safety stack I can't recommend high enough. You'll never get a price that low on those type of products anywhere else. And this is the real deal. I'm on the stack myself as I speak. So let me tell you, I challenge myself for you to challenge me and hold me accountable. Watch this show every week as I stay on it. And you tell us if you see a difference. Now I'm going to get some wise guys right to say, oh, yeah, see this and that. That's fine. Okay. Because I know it works. And that's why we're taking the time to tell you. So tonight, questions and answers. I said earlier in the show, I do not like doing this. Uh, now, uh, especially with live questions that come in, and I want to encourage you to do that. Let me also remind you to take this show and share it around on Facebook. Send the link around uh, to all your friends and family because we need to challenge the, the sayings and the things that are being said about law enforcement today by those that don't know what they're talking about. And we like to think we do know what we're talking about. We are law enforcement. Our guests are law enforcement. And uh, if you like this show, you'll love our podcast located right on the front page of our website, lawofficer.com, where we every week interview uh, dynamic people in the profession, introduce you to them and what they stand for. And it really will encourage you in this profession. So question number one, it came through our email right after the election. Uh, I hesitate to answer this, but question number one, how do you think Donald Trump will change law enforcement. Uh, actually, we wrote an article based on this called How Trump Can Uncuff Law Enforcement. I will say this, uh, Donald Trump received the endorsement of the National Fraternal, Fraternal Order of Police, largest police union. Uh, he's been very friendly to law enforcement even before he ran for president. People say, well, maybe he just did that for politics, Travis. Well, I actually know people that have been around him for several, several years and they always told me how friendly he was and complimentary he was and how down to earth he was to them. This was before he even was running for president. Uh, I have one particular friend that's out in Florida by one of his homes there. That he, when he flies in, he sometimes does security there at the airport when he flies in. He says every time he lands, he calls him by name and uh, asks about his family. And is just really a friendly guy. And you may say, ah, oh, but that's not a big deal. Well, it's a big deal when he's the only one that's ever done it. And this guy guards a lot of celebrities. So... Uh, why do I think he's been genuine about his support for law enforcement? Simply because there was no benefit to him to support law enforcement. If you, if you remember back in the election, none of the candidates were really even mentioned in law enforcement except maybe Hillary and Bernie, and they had some very bad things to say about us because they thought that their constituents wanted to hear that. I think the opposite is true, by the way. We know from Gallup that America really supports what you do. Uh, we're at an all-time high and the media is at an all-time low with respect value. So I want you to encourage you that although the news media may paint one picture, there is quite a different picture out there. Boy, that's, that, that's got to that's gotta hurt them, doesn't it? Because they certainly painted one picture for us in the election, and another picture was actually elected into office, President-elect Trump, soon to be president here in a little over a month. And uh, what, how can he change law enforcement? Well, I can tell you there's a couple of things that come to mind. Number one, President Obama has been very uh, strict with the 1033 program where law enforcement uh, can get military surplus equipment to help them. And there's been different 
articles written on that. We've written our own share of articles. Some people say, well, he wasn't really that strict. Well, actually he was. There, there were actually departments that had some armored vehicles that they had gotten from the program that they went and confiscated and took back from them. Now, what if one of those departments would have been San Bernardino, California? Last Christmas, there was uh, a shooting by a terrorist inside a Christmas office party that they used their armored vehicle to help capture and eventually kill these terrorists. Well, what if that had been in Orlando where uh, the Pulse nightclub had a mass shooting of another terrorist and police used their armored vehicle to breach the exterior of that club and to go in and to save patrons. So uh, he actually has been pretty hamstrung on us and that's mainly been political. You know, it kind of came out of Ferguson where the police used riot gear because they were getting rocks and bottles thrown at them, and, and that became seen as a military act, right? Well, does anybody remember what happened when police were told to take off their gear because it looked too scary? Yeah, they were shot. Yeah, anybody remember that? Anybody care about that? And so this equipment and gear is there for a reason, and President Obama, with the stroke of a pen, can open the 1033 program back up to what it was. Uh, we actually were contacted last week by the Department of Defense because they saw our article on 1033, and they didn't take too kindly to some of the things we said. I like the Department of Defense is paying attention to what we're saying. That means we're making an impact. And uh, we, we went back and forth, and we were polite and professional as always. You know what? And they pretty much were as well. Uh, but we agreed to disagree. Uh, we want this program open back up for law enforcement. Now, we're not talking about the press has made a big deal about, oh, the police got bayonets and they got grenade launchers. That's not what we're talking about. That has been so blown out of proportion, it's not even funny. I mean, does anybody ever seen a police department walk around with bayonets? No, of course not. But that doesn't, that doesn't keep the media from talking about that, and the president's even mentioned it as well. So he can open that up with the stroke of a pen. Second off, he can use the Department of Justice for what they're supposed to be for, investigating federal crimes. The Department of Justice resources have been used very, very much so in the last eight years to investigate police departments, and they often find that there's nothing wrong with the police departments. Uh, but so that a lot of resources have been used on that. Now, I am not saying that we should never put a consent decree on a police department or the federal government should never investigate a police department. It should only be done when it's warranted. And right now, if a few activists pick up the phone and call Washington, D.C., they're flying down to the department without even looking at the evidence. And listen, there's so much the DOJ can do before that happens, i.e., there's FBI agents in every jurisdiction in America. How about letting the FBI do their job and look into the situation? Look at the evidence. More times than not, they're going to find that what the activists or the politicians were screaming isn't even true. Just like Ferguson, should I say, because everything seems to hinge off of Ferguson, Missouri, and it was a complete lie. Now, I've gotten in trouble for saying this, but if you don't believe me that Ferguson, Missouri, hands up, don't shoot, was a complete lie, read the Department of Justice report. I don't think the DOJ went to Ferguson to be friendly to law enforcement. I think they sent people to Michael Brown's funeral, and they went to Ferguson, and I think they went there to try to find that officer in the fault and to criminally charge him. And guess what they found when they actually put witnesses on a stand under oath, threatening them with perjury? Oh, I just made that up. It was good for TV. You know, I didn't really see anything. And, and we find out that the officer was completely justified, and he loses his career for what? Because of a DOJ that couldn't wait for the facts to come out. Uh, yeah, they released the facts a year later, but we all know that the first impression, the first story sticks, right? And so the officer's life, for the most part, has been ruined career-wise because of a DOJ that is completely out of control. Now, I had a Department of Justice person in my class just the other day. Uh, I'm involved in a class called Courageous Leadership. LawOfficer.com very graciously uh, uh, advertises that course on our website. You'll find that at the bottom of our articles. And it's been a very successful class, but this is some of the things that I talk about in the class, that we've got to have the courage to do what's right. Because it's easy just to go, oh, call the DOJ. You know, do, do your chiefs do this and sheriffs do this? No, yeah, right, okay. Well, that should scare you. But, but <laughs> call the DOJ? No. You don't call the DOJ unless there's something wrong, okay? Just because you have political pressure, stand up to the political pressure and tell them what's right and tell them what the truth is. There is a lack of truth being told, and our officers deserve the truth. What else can Trump do? I just went blank there for a minute. Uh, he can also help law enforcement in regards to our staffing. We're going to talk a little bit later about how difficult it is for 
police agencies to keep up with the crime in front of them because most, especially larger cities, the tax base is not what it used to be. And there's a myriad of economic reasons for that that we're not going to go into on this show. That's not our wheelhouse, so to speak. But President Trump could do what Bill Clinton did many, many years ago and really unleash a lot of money to help law enforcement hire additional police officers. And he should also release that same money in the inner cities to help give so many of our kids and our people in the inner cities hope uh, to, to, to get jobs and to stay out of trouble and things like that. So there's a whole bunch of issues with that. So he can actually release money for not only police officers, but for training. Every jurisdiction in America has a federal training liaison officers attached to their federal district attorney's office. Most of you listening in law enforcement have never heard of this person, but this is their job, because I know a few of them. Tommy Loftus is one of my favorites. He's down in southern Alabama. He does a great job. He actually facilitates training for local law enforcement all across Alabama, and he uses federal dollars to do it because they have budgets for this. Uh, now, don't ask me why we don't all know about this, but every one of you in your federal jurisdiction has this liaison officer to local law enforcement. They can start training us and helping us with these training that is, you know, seems to be so hard for some departments to do. So uh, he can use not new federal money, but he can use current federal money more wisely and provide better training, provide more officers, support law enforcement in America, use the Department of Justice, not being political, but using what they're supposed to be for investigating federal crimes because we do need the help in that area. And really just generally take politics in Washington, D.C. out of local law enforcement. If there's, a, if there's a local department with a problem, by all means, take a look at it. But we have seen time and time again the trust of the community is hurt even worse when the DOJ runs to a community, investigates the department, you know, everybody knows it's happening, there's news reports being written, and what do they find at the end of the day? Well, there's nothing wrong here. And guess what happens? What does the trust do in the community? Well, they think because they were there, there's something wrong. And then it, it hurts that local agency after the DLJ leaves or try to rebuild that trust. So you, you can't use that stick very often, right? It needs to be used on a limited basis when it's needed. And, uh, you know, I wasn't a fan of Bill Clinton, but I'll tell you, Bill Clinton hired a lot of police officers through his COPS program. And Bill Clinton did use the DLJ for some consent decrees, but it was very few and very selected. And it was generally needed when it happened. LAPD Rampart comes to mind for one instance. Uh, nowadays, they're using it like candy, right? And it's really put a division between law enforcement and the DOJ. It's put a division in law enforcement and the community. So there's many things that Donald Trump can do without passing one bit of legislation, without passing one law, and that is just simply supporting local law enforcement. And I think uh, until recently, we were very used to that. And as we can all see, uh, when the man at the top, or the girl at the top, hadn't been a girl yet, there will be one day, when the man or girl at the top has a certain attitude, that attitude spreads. And all it took was our president seven years ago talking about a local cop in Massachusetts and called him stupid or said he did a stupid thing. That was, the, that was the indicator that let the rest of America know, well, we can disrespect law enforcement, we can do what we want, and it has just gone downhill from there. Now, I will give President Obama some credit. He has tried to rectify that, and he has spoken uh, much better in the last 12 months. Uh, but man, there was a lot of damage done before that, and I'm afraid that it's going to take some time to kind of regain that and to get that back. So uh, we just, we don't want favors, we just want fairness. And that's what I would ask President Trump, uh, that he will never watch this show, but I would ask him that if I was ever in front of him. We just want fairness. You know, we're not looking for special treatment, uh, we're not looking for favors, just be fair. And I think that's all anybody really wants. Well, that's a long answer to question one. I'm not sure we're going to get through all of these tonight. Uh, question two. We are seeing agencies lowering their hiring requirements. My producer is sending these to my screen, so I apologize for that. What are your thoughts on that? We are seeing agencies lowering their hiring requirements. Actually, there's an article uh, on our website right here today on the front page about Chicago. Chicago's mayor, Ram Emanuel, uh, is looking at lowering their hiring standards because he wants to hire more minorities. Now, let me tell you something. That, to me, I'm not a minority, but that to me, if I was a minority, would be insulting. You mean to tell me that for a minority to be a police officer in this country, you must lower your standards? That's ridiculous. Let me tell you what's going on here. They're being lazy because there are a ton of minorities eligible to work in law enforcement. A whole bunch, okay? A whole bunch. 
and they're just being flat out lazy uh, by lowering standards. And we've seen throughout our history departments that lowered standards. It was a complete disaster. Miami-Dade back in the 80s reminds me of one of those. They ended up hiring gang members and crack dealers and all kinds of drama and really black eyes came from that issue. So we can't lower our standards. We must keep our standards higher. It's what makes us different from other professions, right? And if you don't do your due diligence on the front end and hire the right people, you're going to have a lot of problems on the back end. So that's the last thing Chicago needs with their 700 plus homicides and their shortage in law enforcement is to actually lower their standards. I would tell Chicago, uh, hey, you should represent your community. You should hire plenty of minorities like every community do. Our, our department should represent what is in our community. And they're out there. You just have to work for it. My agency travels all over the United States. Okay, we spend thousands upon thousands of dollars. We travel all over the United States looking for the right candidate. And shame on you if you're not doing the same, if you're out there. You don't really believe uh, that, you know, you just don't really care about it, quite honestly. The easy thing to do is to lower standards. So it's a horrible idea. And uh, I don't care. Some people will say, well, Travis, drugs is more mainstream now. I don't care. Do you want your cops rolling around smoking joints? <laughs> you know, do you want your cops snorting line of cocaine? I mean, come on, we, let's not be silly about this. There are many good Americans of all races, of all ethnicities, that can be great police officers. Now, not everybody can, but there are a few. And uh, I would say to any department that's recruiting, uh, you know, go out there and find them. And let me tell you, there's a great resource right here at lawofficer.com. We just had another agency sign up this week, and that's our law officer partner uh, partners page. And that is uh, uh, where we offer actually free job listings to help you with recruiting. But man, you take it to the next level, we actually build you a recruiting website. We attach it to our network of other recruit websites. We publish uh, your recruit stories and recruit news on our platform. Our social media has close to a million followers. And uh, it's going to give you a light switch to open up your agency to the world, so to speak. You know, most departments recruit in their general area, right? So maybe if you're looking for more minority candidates, man, that kind of limits you. But if you open up that recruiting window to all across the United States, uh, it's going to help you get a lot more recruits and a lot more interest. And that's what our uh, partner uh, sites can do. And uh, I'm telling you, <laughs> You, you're going to think I'm crazy if I told you the price. I'm not going to tell you the price. It is so cheap. I, I just can't believe our business folks have done this. But it's a service to law enforcement. They know that if the price is too high, the law enforcement would not be able to do it. And some of you are thinking, well, I've got my own website. This is different. This website, number one, would probably be better than anything you've ever seen because we've got some samples out there and the department's already doing it right now. But secondly, it's attached to our network where we, we are getting millions of views every single month from across the country. So, and many of those are people interested in law enforcement or those in law enforcement. So do yourself a favor and check that out. You'll actually find that on the front page of our website under the job section, and you'll see that partner section. You'll see some other departments that are doing that, and, and they're having great success with that. So uh, yeah, when you see the price, you're not going to believe it. You're going to think it's some type of scam, but it's not. It's just a service that we want to provide to you, and I can tell you the technical things behind that and the cost on our end behind that, we're not, there's not much money being made. Uh, but it's something that you really need to look at, and uh, I'm really amazed that people aren't uh, you know, looking at other things. It's kind of an outside-the-box thinking, right? I mean, we, we, we go to recruiting fairs, right? You know, we, we make phone calls. Listen, this opens your department up across the nation. If you're in Toledo, Ohio, and you have a local story or a local recruiting story, put it on your website, maybe your local news channel runs it. Who sees that outside of Toledo, Ohio? Not many. None, really. Well, all of a sudden, you're connected to our partner network, uh, millions of people are seeing that, and uh, we'll use our social media platforms to broadcast your agency and what you're doing, and it's really a, even just a PR issue for you to make you look really, really great like you are. So let us help you with that. Check it out. Contact us if you have any questions. We'd love to help you with that. Next question. Wow, these are big questions tonight. Why are there instances when law enforcement kills unarmed people? Well, this is the one thing that really drives me crazy with media today where uh, we'll see headlines, you know, black suspect shot by a white police officer and he's unarmed, you know. And what does that unarmed mean? People take for granted that unarmed means that people aren't dangerous. 
And that's just simply not true. In fact, uh, the case law that dictates deadly force for law enforcement is a case you've heard us reference many times called Graham v. Connor. It's a 1989 case. And that case never talks about whether they have weapons or not. It talks about the risk being posed. It talks about the situation. The officers have to make split-second decisions. I mean, those of you out there that maybe are immediately going, oh, yeah, there he is trying to defend shooting unarmed people, do yourself a favor and look up Graham v. Connor, read the case. And you tell me what you think that means. And what it means is, is it doesn't matter whether people have weapons or not. If your life is at risk, you can use deadly force. And we just saw that this week in uh, Pima County, Arizona. Articles on the front page of our website where uh, two deputies arrest a female, and I, I got to tell you, a relatively attractive female, not that you should put your guard down, but it's not the typical suspect that we think. A relatively attractive female, drunk, DUI, they go to arrest her, she goes crazy. She ends up getting one of the officers on the ground and takes her high heel and shoves it into his eye and he loses his eye in the assault. And then she assaults the other deputy to the point where he goes to the hospital before they were able to get her in custody. This officer is probably going to lose his career. Could have lost his life, really, with that type of injury. Why? She's unarmed. She's a female. You know what? What's it matter? I mean, so you kind of see the sense here. And when you look at the numbers, uh, it's not like it happens all the time. Almost 95% of the time, bad guys have weapons. It's just that simple. In fact, uh, the Washington Post did us a real big favor. You've heard us reference it. They started tracking in 2015 people killed by the police. And let me tell you why they did it. They, they, they didn't do it to help us out. They did it because they wanted to prove that we were racist. And what they've proven is that we're not racist. No, most people don't point that out. But let me tell you what 2015's numbers were. In 2015, uh, we shot and killed 991 people. I'm not going to break it down because the breakdown this year is almost identical. So far this year, we've shot 912. What's at the end of the year? I don't know, but it's very similar to last year. So, so far in 2016, We've shot 912 people. But the media says we shoot a bunch of black people and we shoot a bunch of unarmed people. That is not true. These are the facts. Here's the facts. You can look it up yourself, Washington Post. Uh, you can, in fact, you can type in Officers Daily Shootings, Washington Post. It'll bring you right up to the screen. This year, we've shot and killed 433 white people. This year, we have shot and killed 222 black people. That's 24% of all shootings, 153 Hispanic. And of all those, out of 912 shootings, how many were unarmed? Any guesses? I'll give you a chance to post. Any guesses? 46 out of 912. That's roughly 5%. Now, many times those unarmed individuals are grabbing officers' guns, okay? Uh, they're making furtive movements and doing things that cause the issue to go up. Uh, you know, we don't know those individual cases, but let's say those 46 cases the officers did wrong. We know that's not true. It's absolutely not true. Just like the lady in Arizona who was, she was unarmed and she darn near killed this officer. So we know it's not true, but let's say they all are. 46 in a year. Okay, that's three a month. That's one every 10 days. Maybe, yeah, close. Does that mean there's rampant racism in law enforcement? No. In fact, those 46 are white and black and all kinds of races, right? You break that down to, uh, to black males, it's, you know, it's much less than that. So when these incidents hit main, the news media for weeks upon a time, it makes it seem like there's a problem. When you really look at the numbers, there's not. Now, one in 912, if one, in, one is a bad shooting, that's a problem. We've, we must address that, right? But let's not kid ourselves. In this country, with the mental illness issues, and by the way, about 25% of our shootings involve mental health patients with weapons, okay? With the mental illness issues, with the amount of guns in this country, there's estimation of a half a billion guns in this country. With all the issues we deal with, we only shoot and kill 912. That should be the headline. We only shoot 912. We are using de-escalation tactics and tasers and less lethal technologies like we've never done before. Our shootings and our shooting deaths are at a all-time low in law enforcement history. But no one's telling you that, right? No one's telling you that. So let's we call it the way we see it. But now somebody will immediately say, well, listen, you 24% of the people you shot and killed were black. And there's only 13% population. That means you're racist. That's, that's really ridiculous. Okay. Who does, who, what does law enforcement encounter? Who does law enforcement encounter? We encounter criminal activity. 
Now, people are going to accuse me of being racist. I've been called all kinds of names. You wouldn't even believe it, right, by speaking these facts. And they're doing that for a reason. They're doing that to censor you and to censor us. They don't want us to tell the truth, but it's just the truth. I'm not making judgments here. We shoot and kill this year 24% African American. Do you know what percentage of African Americans commit homicide in this country this year? Well over 50%. Do you know how many African Americans in this country commit armed robberies this year? Well over 50%. Do you know how many African Americans commit all violent crimes in this country this year? Well over 50%. That's not me speaking, that's the FBI speaking. They, they, run, those, they run those stats. And those are actually not the police saying what race is, that's the victims saying what the race is. And so violent crime specifically, it's off the chart for African Americans. Now why is that? That's not for me to decide, okay? That's not for me to talk about and judge, okay? We're going to talk about what I think we can do in the inner cities here in a minute. But that's just the facts. And so is it not plausible that law enforcement's going to encounter them at a little higher rate if they're committing violent crimes in their community? Listen, if you disagree with that, you're just not thinking logically. You're caught up in emotion. We respond to violent crimes. We respond to areas where violence is occurring. As a citizen, that's what the citizens demand. And so to, for us to shoot and kill 24% when the population is 13%, that to me is not that much of a disparity. In fact, I kind of question why it's not even a little higher than that, simply because of the amount of crime being committed. Now, you can email me and call me and call my chief, which some of you have done, and say I'm some racist and Nazi. I'm telling you what the facts are, okay? That's the facts. I'm not judging anybody, but that's the facts. And there are social economic issues that are causing that. There's over 700 homicides in Chicago this year. You know how many of those are black on black homicides? Well over 90%. That's a lack of hope in communities. That's a, that's a, that's a, a culture of death as one pastor called it there in Chicago. Um, that's nothing we, I control. That's nothing our law enforcement controls. That comes down to society right? And we have got to somehow grab back hope and to let people know that there is hope and they don't have to commit this violence. And that goes way beyond what law enforcement's capabilities are. Uh, so often we're just kind of picking up the, the carnage, so to speak, when it's over with. Uh, and, uh, and to try to take all of this law enforcement stuff and say we're somehow racist, it's just not fair. Uh, are there individuals that are bad in law enforcement? Yeah, but I would challenge you to compare that with any other profession. Uh, we are the most ethical, we're the most professional, we are just, it's just, I'm impressed every day. And if you're not, you're not paying attention to what law enforcement does. So let's not take a few bad apples and blanket the entire profession. You know what that's called? That's called discrimination. And uh, everybody out there would not want that to happen to them, right? And so uh, let's just be very careful about that. And I'm sorry if it offends you, but I'm not speaking opinion, I'm telling you what the facts are. And those are the facts. You can, you can look at them for yourself. Go to WashingtonPost.com. I think that's what it is. Go to uh, the FBI uh, offender data. Just type in FBI offender data. And that's what victims tell the police the race of the, of the person is. And let me tell you, most, most crime is race against race. So when we have a very high echelon of African Americans committing violent crime, who are they committing that against? That's right, African Americans. And uh, that is really the shame in that because that is really unfortunate. Uh, that if you're an African American in this country, you are more susceptible to being a victim of a violent crime. And that is something that we must all deal with in this country because that is not right, it's not fair, and uh, we all owe a responsibility to do all we can to prevent that. And that's why I'm so proud of law enforcement around this country that is doing that exactly. I know there's a few that try to call them names and tell them not to enforce laws and this and that. We cannot listen to that. We cannot listen to that. Boy, that's a heavy question. Now, what do we got next here? What do you see as the biggest challenges facing law enforcement in the next decade? That's a big question. And I'm sure there's a lot of different opinions on that, but this is what I see. I see crime changing to cyber crimes and to online crimes. We have not done a really great job nationally in really dealing with that. We're not equipped to deal with that. I mean, when I came into law enforcement 23 years ago, we wrote with, with pen and paper, for goodness sakes. And so now we're dealing with international crimes and computer crimes and cyber crimes. And I think we've got to really address that because people are being victims of this constantly and we've got to be able to address that. The next thing is staffing. I talked about that earlier is, is our budgets and our staffing is not going to get any better, especially in the larger cities where the tax base just isn't there anymore and, and, you know, and the drain of the budgets are happening. So we've got to do something about that. We've put Band-Aids on some of that. I've heard of the alternative shifts, 10-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts, you know, like the nurses do. 
uh, to try to put band-aids on that with low staffing. At the end of the day, we need more people. Uh, the challenges are rising in law enforcement, and we need people, personnel, and expertise to deal with that. And so that's a huge challenge in the next decade. Cyber crimes is a huge challenge in the next decade and budgets and staffing, of course. So next question, we move along here pretty quick. We have about 10 minutes to go. If you haven't got your questions in, get those in as quick as you can, and we'd love to get to at least a few of those. We've seen a lot of articles about agencies struggling to recruit, struggling to recruit. How can this be fixed? Well, I kind of touched on this earlier. Huge problems in recruiting. I saw today with a Pennsylvania State Police is hiring 500 officers. Chicago's having to hire a whole bunch. Dallas needs 9,000 applicants. We wrote, that story was written yesterday for you. They're on lawofficer.com. And, you know, there's this kind of anti-law enforcement sentiment, which I don't quite believe, but recruiting has struggled. You know, it's, it's, it has been more difficult for agencies to find that recruiting. Well, we need to keep doing what we're doing. We need to keep going to job fairs. We need to keep advertising. And let me tell you, here at Lawfster.com, as I've already mentioned, we've opened something up that nobody's ever thought of and done before. I'm so proud of our business team for this. We will build you a recruiting website, even with your own domain if you like. We'll attach it to our network, and you will literally get sent thousands, if not millions, of viewers and visitors to look at your department, and it will help you in recruiting. I'm just convinced of it. We're getting testimonials now that are off the charts. We have agencies jumping on board. And uh, it's taxing our, our tech team, to be honest with you, but I'm committed to this program because I know it can help you. So check that out there on the front page of lawster.com when it comes to recruiting. And also, we have a job section on there that's completely free, so if you're looking for jobs, you can go on there and look for all our job openings there. So we did that because we saw a need, we saw a service. Recruiting's huge, so check that out. Next question, when you see Chicago with over 700 homicides this year and the large major cities seeing a dramatic increase in homicides and violent crime, what is the cause and how can it be corrected? I touched on this earlier, uh, but I think there's a lack of hope. And actually the Chicago commissioner, police commissioner, said that a few months ago that the only reason a, a young man would pick up a gun and shoot people is because he has, he has no hope for a real life. And I think we've got to somehow provide that hope. Now, uh, can law enforcement do a small part of that? Yes, but we owe it. Our churches need to get involved. We need to put economic development in our inner cities to give people jobs, to give them hope, to, to let them see a way out of their, of their horrible situations. And slowly but surely, I think we can come out of that. Uh, it's going to be a long haul, but it's taken 30, 40 years to get in the position we're in. When people feel like they're victims, Right? And they feel like, I'm talking about a victim mentality in regards to, you know, I can't do anything for myself. That's what I'm talking about. And there are victims of crime, obviously, but when people feel like they're victims and they can't do anything for themselves and they need the government to help them and they need this person to help them and they really are just incapable of doing it, that's a problem. Everybody born in this country, born on the planet, deserves hope, right? And so uh, we as law enforcement, we can do a small part. We can provide hope to some kids and communities and to do our best. And sometimes some people call that community police, and I just call that being a good cop, right? Just taking the extra time in some of these cities and communities to, to help people when you can. You're going to see a lot of those stories coming out in the next week around Christmas time where policemen are just doing the right thing for people. And so that provides hope to needy people. And I think uh, we've got to really take a hard look at that. It's obvious one thing in Chicago and other large cities that's seen an increase in homicide. 25 largest cities in this country have seen an increase 14% in homicides. That's the most in almost 40 years. Uh, one thing for sure is what we've been doing is not working. So I think it's time for something different. So I'm excited to see what that is going to look like. But whatever it is, it must provide hope. Boy, that's a tough question. Let's see what the next one is. You talk a lot about poor leadership in law enforcement. This is uh, our uh, email here. I'm retired, but I started in law enforcement in the 1970s. Thank you for your service. And we complained about leadership then. Is it really worse than it used to be? You know, um, I think it is. I think what we saw in the 70s and 80s, we saw a lot of Vietnam vets joining law enforcement. They learned to be leaders by some of the greatest leaders on this planet, the military, right? And they brought those paramilitary tactics to law enforcement. And that is what sometimes we complain about, is kind of the drill sergeant mentality. But in many, many ways, it really worked. And it, it made all of us better. It, made, it challenged all of us. When I came on, I worked for Vietnam veterans as my sergeants and lieutenants and captains. And, and I saw the value in that. They're no longer with us. And 
we are the ones left to take up the torch. And what I've seen recently is, is number one, we don't prepare our officers to be leaders. Oh, we prepare them to be managers. We prepare them to be pencil pushers and paper pushers and sit behind a desk. But we don't prepare them to be leaders. First off, any rank can be a leader. We got to get that out of our minds that just sergeants are leaders or majors or chiefs. No, no. If you wear this badge, you are a leader. And we must decentralize that leadership to where you can lead your peers because that's when greatness begins. And uh, I've deemed it courageous leadership, that we need more courageous leadership. And what is courage? Well, courage is when you do something because it's the right thing, no matter the consequences. Uh, I'm proud of a seminar I'm involved in called Courageous Leadership. And uh, check that out if you want to. And uh, I just think it's important. We build it on several peer, several tiers there in the class. We talk about courageous training. What does training look like? Real training? Do you have the courage to provide the right training? We talk a lot, a lot about that here. What does courageous policy look like? Will you build policy based on what the Supreme Court says? Or will you cower down to uh, people that know nothing about law enforcement, so to speak? Uh, courageous conversations where can you talk to your people and make sure they're safe and they're telling things that are hard to say but must be said. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different facets of it. I'm not going to go into it here, but uh, check that out if you want. Uh, usually at the bottom of articles, you'll see a quick ad on that. But we're proud of that. Uh, proud of law officers kind of picking that mantle up and helping with that because Lord knows we need better leaders and I like to think we need more courageous leaders. One more question, and I'm willing to take one from the audience. We may have time for that if you want to get that in. There seems to be a big divide between law enforcement and African Americans. Boy, big time questions tonight. There seems to be a big divide between law enforcement and African Americans. How can this be fixed? Well, first off, uh, we've talked about this somewhat in the past, is I think we in law enforcement should acknowledge the sins of our fathers, so to speak. You know, I speak to many minorities and they tell these horrible stories about police, but you know what? They weren't victims of that story. Where did they get that story? They heard it from their dad, who heard it from their grandpa, and you know, they're going all the way back to the 40s and 50s. And listen, I think we would all agree that, you know, decades ago, uh, law enforcement really mistreated a lot of people uh, for no good reason than, than what they looked like, and that was wrong. But, you know, none of you watching this, and, me, and we had nothing to do with that. But I think we're sort of a victim of hearing that and seeing that represented. Uh, I had a friend of mine tell me, he says, you know, Travis, uh, uh, he's an African-American kid, great kid, I call him a kid, he's younger than me. Uh, he says, you know, Travis, uh, uh, many, in, many in the black community hate the police. I said, come on, man. I go, how can that be? I've worked in minority communities for most of my career, and I, I, it's some, some of the greatest people uh, you'll ever meet, you know, good, hardworking people. And uh, they have criminal elements like everybody else has criminal elements, but the vast majority great people. He says, well, when I was a kid, my parents taught me to play hide and seek by running from the police. I said, what? He goes, yeah, yeah. He said, I was taught to hate you. I was taught to run from you. And I said, well, that's maybe just your, that's maybe just your upbringing, right? I mean, surely that's not, you know, a, a massive thing. He goes, oh, no, it pretty much was throughout my community. Now, I don't know if that's the way it is in your community, but that really was a blow to me because I had no idea. And so much of this comes from the past. So we got to get past that. And I think an easy way to get past that is just we acknowledge it and let's move on and get better. And then we get through it by relationships. It's just that simple. You can throw out any terminology you want, community policing, guardianship. Listen, it's about relationships. We must form relationships with those we serve. And once we went inside police cars, right, we got away from those Pelian principles, we went inside police cars and, and we got the windows up and we drive around, nobody can talk to us anymore unless it's a negative in, in encounter like a traffic stop or a 911 call. So we've got to build relationships and that takes time. That comes back to the staffing as I talked about earlier. If you don't have the people to do it, it's really difficult to do it, but I think we're at a point where we have to do it. And listen, I think at first it may be seen as kind of odd because we've not always been great at that. But through time and through generations, it will vastly improve. And I don't want to talk about it. I know the question come in is there's this big divide. By the way, there's not a big divide. Uh, the Gallup poll showed that. The vast majority of African Americans highly respect what you do. But obviously the media has propagated a very small group there and uh, made it seem like a big divide. There's not a big divide. So don't come out of this show thinking that because that's not the case. But can we improve in every community we have? Absolutely. And it's all of our duty to do that. Uh, I've, I've thoroughly always enjoyed doing that and taking the time to do that. 
And it really starts with relationships. Not a program. Programs are great, right? Not an athletic league. Athletic leagues are great. You know, not a, you know, not a, a, a social media campaign, although that's great, or a PR campaign or a marketing campaign. It starts with the officer and the citizen forming a relationship. And when that citizen trusts you enough to call you when things are going on, you know you've made it, right? You know you've made it. So let's build our departments in that fashion to where uh, we can work on that. And we have work to do, but that's okay. Uh, we're professionals, and we're up for the task. And with that said, it takes two, right? As we do that, we also expect the community to start bringing that trust and for them to form that relationship because it takes two to have a relationship. So I think that's what's often lost. You know, there's all these demands on police, all these demands on police. Well, listen, last time I walked through a, a, a minority neighborhood after homicide and everyone was outside when it happened, you know what everybody told me? I didn't see anything. Hey, listen, those communities also owe us some trust and respect like we owe them trust and respect. So uh, if we do our part, they will come along. I'm just, I'm convinced of that because I know it's some of the greatest people on this planet. So um, I don't know if we have any questions. We really don't have time for questions. I'm already over. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. But listen, let me, let me thank you so much for joining in. Uh, the hour goes quick. Uh, nobody else is doing this type of thing. I'm answering these questions. I'm really putting myself out there. But it's important for the public to hear this. And I'm, like I said, I'm not a big fan of it. But it's so important, we're going to keep doing it, you know, every couple of months or so. Uh, so we want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, God bless you. If you don't tune in before Christmas, we want to wish you a, a very Merry Christmas. And uh, just embrace those around you. Make sure this time of year, and we know it's difficult, to make sure that everyone around you is healthy and well. And uh, always, you can always contact us if you have anything. You've been watching Law Officer Live. Uh, it's been our pleasure to serve you. We'll see you next week.